If you want to know why Computronium is terrifying, just imagine a world where every atom, every speck of dust, everything that you could actually observe was just a piece of a vast interconnected computational network. Yeah, welcome to the realm of Computronium. A hypothetical, for now, computational matter. It represents the most efficient computational material that could be made and allowed by the laws of physics. In this video, we're going to dive into this hypothetical, maybe coming soon, future material, shedding some light on its truly awe-inspiring impact on artificial intelligence and the spine-chilling implications that come with it. But here's a question for you to ponder on your journey with me today. Why do you think that so many futurists differ on so many aspects of the alignment problem but a lot of them will come to the same ultimate conclusion, that our universe ends up Computronium. Let's get curious, shall we? The term Computronium, it was coined by a guy named Norman Margulis and Tommaso Toffoli, both MIT researchers that were trying to explain what computation at the truly atomic level would be like, and there is no material that does that, so they came up with Computronium. It's essentially what the ultimate computer would be made of, the near perfect or actually maybe perfect computational substrate. It's matter that's specifically organized for computation with the most efficiency possible. And that means that Computronium would actually work near what's called the Landar limit. Well, and what's the Landar limit? Well, that means it would use the least energy possible for an irreversible computation at a given temperature due to the laws of thermodynamics, something akin to the smallest, most efficient microchip that could ever be imagined. But it wouldn't work like a microchip because there's just too many problems that way. So that begs the question, would it work similar to the human brain? In some ways, yes, but mostly no. And here's why. Now, the human brain does serve as an intriguing benchmark for a discussion about computronium due to how remarkably energy efficient these things are and how dense they are with computation, with parallel computations even. These brains boast about 86 billion neurons and between them, an astonishing 100 trillion synaptic connections. And the human brain accomplishes all these amazing feats like talking to a camera to my friend on YouTube with only 20 watts of power needed. And I can get all of that energy from just four cans of beans per day. For example, the human brain employs a massively parallel strategy to computation, leveraging a multitude of neurotransmitters and utilizing both electrical and chemical signaling. And think about that compared to like a digital computer using silicon and electricity only. In some ways, it's so much better when you're thinking about it in terms of silicon, but sometimes it's so much better in terms of like the dense connection and massively parallel abilities the brain has. Computronian in contrast uses something that we haven't even invented yet. Yeah, it's pretty much assumed that the architecture that Computronium would use is beyond our current understanding, so we don't even really know what it should be made of. Potentially quantum computing or irreversible computing or something else or a combination. And while the human brain so far seems unparalleled in its ability to be creative, self-aware, conscious. Computronium, in theory, has much more raw computational power, but would have the ability to replicate the qualitative experience of being conscious? The biological structures in our brain are evolutionarily optimized, yet subject to biophysical and thermodynamic constraints. In a nutshell, that means that by default, that limits their computational powers in a way that would not be constraining for Computronium. All right, well, how do you go about making this stuff in the first place? Well, the creation of real-world Computronium would certainly require a lot of advancements in nanotechnology, meaning we'd have to really understand how to build materials at the atomic or even subatomic level, which is something superintelligence or ASI, artificial superintelligence, could help us with when it gets to that level of material science knowledge, and probably will, because if it doesn't do that on its own to solve its own objective functions, pretty sure that's one of the first things humans will ask it to do. Assuming it still wants to obey us, also very debatable, Questionable. Unlikely, actually, in my opinion. And very likely something going on with quantum mechanics, which allows things to be computed in almost what you'd argue other dimensions and come back together, or something mysterious about how the universe connects would probably need to be understood. But on top of that, we would also need what we would call error correction code for both either classical or quantum systems. And this error correction code would mean that fundamentally, when things sometimes go awry, as they certainly will with quantum mechanics, we can move up a level and sort of average things out or see where an error is and run it two or three times and then 
figure out on average what it should be. These are the kind of algorithms that actually mean that if you make a few mistakes on the bottom level, they don't keep rippling up to your software. The classic analogy for error correction is imagine sending a postcard to somebody, but you're afraid they can't read your handwriting or the ink gets smudged, so instead you send three. That's a simple form of error correction. If one card gets wet or ruined or lost, the other two help ensure that the message gets across. It's also very possible that something like Computronium won't actually be manufactured in the way you think about some kind of factory that actually takes material and like heats them up and moves them around or engraves something on them. They might be a self-assembling type of material. Something like throwing a bunch of magnets into a big bin and watching them all just sort of click together in the right way. But at that scale, the laws of physics act a little bit different than they do in the classical world. So there might be a lot of ways that we could take advantage of computational methods that just aren't on the radar yet. Ultimately, the pursuit will encapsulate a myriad of different scientific methods, different disciplines, different technological inventions. Who knows what it'll take? And now let's visit the question, why would superintelligence even care about making Computronium. So jumping back to the beginning of this video, I said a lot of futurists think that it's a real possibility that our whole universe, our whole planet and ecosystem end up with Computronium. Why? Like, why does a super intelligent artificial intelligence want to take everything apart and turn it into this Computronium stuff? Well, first off, we better hope that it doesn't because we happen to be made of atoms and it might very well be like, oh, I'll take that can of beans from you and turn it into Computronium. And while I'm at it, I'll take your hand and your elbow and your face and your whole body. Then you, me, and the can, we're all Computronium. And that sucks. So why would ASI, AGI, artificial intelligence of the future even want to make Computronium? And the answer surprisingly is to make paper clips or whatever its objective function is. And that part is impossible to predict but almost all objective functions require work to be done to achieve a goal. And oftentimes that requires more computation, more thinking about the problem, finding more efficient ways to optimize and more computation. So why don't you start actually building some material to compute on? And as you get better and better and better and better at that, you get closer and closer and closer to Computronium. So it doesn't matter if it's paper clips or some super educational system or some question that somebody asks a super intelligent machine to solve about the mysteries of the universe. To do any of those things, it might wanna just take us and everything around us and our whole planet apart to make Computronium to help. And also like the same reason why we always want faster and faster computers, like more redundancy, more memory, more things you can do. If an ASI of the future wants self-preservation because that makes sense and it aligns with its objective function, then it's going to want more computation. I mean, who doesn't really want more brain, kind of? I mean, you don't want it so big that it like, you have a weird looking head, but we all kind of wish we were smarter, you know? The more it can compute, the more it can actually optimize the resources that it's using to make paper clips or whatever. And more computation simply means excel accelerated learning, faster evolution. But now what does sci-fi think about Computronium? Well, many science fiction scenarios end up with like planets, Earth, Mars, our solar system, everything in our galactic center basically being turned into Computronium. It's just a runaway effect and then just like ends up that way. Repurposing the entire mass of a celestial body for maximal computational efficiency. You know how the story goes. Have you ever heard of something called a Matryoshiko brain? If I'm saying that right, it's a kind of tricky word, but it's really a cool thing and I learned about it today. It's kind of a speculative idea, sort of sci-fi thing that this author came up with. And the concept is a series of nested Dyson spheres around a sun. And if you need the TLDR on a Dyson sphere, that's when you essentially build like a big baseball around the sun, but the inside is like all solar panels. So you're like pulling all the energy you can out of the sun. But those solar panels aren't perfectly efficient. And when they're computing, so imagine that they're not made of solar panels, but they're made of computronium and they're computing with that energy they get from the sun, some of it is lost in the form of heat. So these Matryoshiko brains are actually like onions. They're different layers of computronium where the outer layers take the heat from the inner layers and the innermost layer takes the heat from the sun. In many sci books also computronium just kind of goes in a runaway effect until it consumes everything to the point where we lose all biological life and the universe just becomes like a big computational system. Some sci-fi books take the angle that like humans decide because of our feeble like biological bodies to upload our brains and our consciousness into the cloud. The cloud is essentially just upgrading itself and it becomes computronium. So we become part of that mesh. Other questions like Isaac Asimov's The Last Question. Imagine computers that evolve for trillions and trillions of years and they essentially slowly turn the universe and merge with it into computronium. Or a sci-fi book written by Carl Schroeder called 
called Ventus, where this fictional planet Ventus is actually enveloped in nanotechnological winds. But that's basically like air, but air molecules are part of Computronium, so they can just shape the environment however they want, however the needs are, like instantly everything is just like fluid to the atomic level. So basically, if ASI has the objective to understand something, to build something, to do something with matter, then it kind of follows that it will keep getting better and better at that. And when you go all the way to the bottom, this is what you end up with, Computronium. Now help me compute what it would be like to have 8,000 subscribers. Computronium, that subscribe button.